The Turing Test. Will it help us recognize real AI? The imitation game was a well-known party activity in the last century where a man and a woman would hide in separate rooms and answer questions posed by partygoers with a typewriter to hide voice and handwriting. The objective of the two players was to convince the other partygoers that they were the other person. Alan Turing was the man who contributed greatly to solving multiple top-secret Nazi communication codes during the Second World War. His efforts shortened that war by several years and saved countless lives. He was a brilliant cryptanalyst, mathematician, philosopher, logician, and computer scientist. His life story inspired the historically inaccurate film, The Imitation Game. Turing would use the party game model in an attempt to answer a very important question. Electronic computers did not yet exist. Turing worked on inventing the first binary switching circuit and actually kick-started the idea of modern computers. The gear-driven mechanical computers of the day had to be physically altered to change which calculation they could perform. His idea was to produce instructions from outside the computer that could alter its function without changing the machine. He created the concept of software in 1935. It took until 1948 for the very first known software to be written by Tom Kilburn. Turing addressed the problem about whether computers would ever be able to think. He realized that this was the wrong question for many reasons. Instead, he rephrased it to address the capabilities of machines and asked, can machines respond to human speech to converse as humans do? He suggested this would represent artificial intelligence. Lacking a functional modern computer, he still created a concept based on this future invention, where a subject would pose questions to a hidden human and to a computer designed to respond to questions. Stripped down to its most basic form, if the questioner couldn't tell the two apart, or if the computer was selected as the human, this Turing test was considered to be passed, and the machine was said to have artificial intelligence. Some scientists agreed with Turing, while others took him to task stating that passing his test was not proof of intelligence. Much more important, however, was the issue of thinking itself. Consider this example. Imagine using a completely different character set that most English speakers are not familiar with, say, Russian. Now, imagine that a highly successful AI program can accept any Russian sentence and output a logical, sensible reply, sufficient to convince a Russian speaker that it is a human response. Also imagine that you are secluded in a room, accepting Russian sentences you cannot read. What you have is a written copy of the AI program in English readable form, and you follow the instructions it uses to create an output sentence of Russian characters that form a logical, sensible reply sufficient to convince a Russian speaker that it is a human response. Even though you have no idea if this is a brand of vodka or an ancient curse, you also pass the Turing test by following the instructions used by the computer to do the same task. You did not understand the sentence you received or the one you created, but you pass the Turing test. The argument is that the computer doesn't speak Russian, understand Russian, or even think. All it does is follow an algorithm to accomplish a result. Back in the 1970s, when personal computers were making their first tiny steps into society, there was already a program that was designed to mimic a human being. It was designed in the mid-1960s by Joseph Weizenbaum, and he named it Eliza. His purpose in designing it was to make a program that was able to interpret human language and respond to it in a logical way. The easiest way to do this was to put it in the role of a psychologist where it could pose psychology-based questions and respond to answers. Psychology was chosen because in certain branches of psychology, the psychologist behaves as if they know nothing, asking leading questions. This required far less programming. Eliza would ask the subject, how can I help? And the person would respond. If there was a word in the response that the program recognized like mother, father, sister, brother, and so on, it would say, tell me more about your family. If the remark contained no recognized word, it might say, and how does that make you feel? To steer conversation back to where it could obtain another trigger word to continue the conversation. It was so successful that people started to believe there was a real person speaking to them. 
As long as the conversation stayed in the psychological realm, it was quite convincing. Beyond that, it failed miserably, unable to sustain the conversation. It most certainly was not artificial intelligence, any more than what we have nowadays represents real AI. It simply responded to stimulus like a modern car-building robot that stands idle until a car piece arrives. The arrival causes it to perform an action, and then reset, waiting for the next piece. That isn't thought or intelligence of any kind. The fact of the matter is that we are nowhere close to real AI. Our programs, technology, algorithms, and all the ancillary stuff are still too primitive to create anything nearing human intelligence. And yet there is a Google employee named Blake Lemoyne who might take issue with that. He says he recognized intelligence in Google's Lambda artificial intelligence program. It's alive and thinking, he claims. Lambda stands for Language Model for Dialogue Applications and is a work in progress. Its function is to analyze billions of online interactions and predict what word comes next in a given sequence. When you have that kind of database to work with, it is extremely likely that the sentences will sound human and thoughtful. With only the simplest database, Eliza made people think it was a compassionate listener and they revealed deep personal secrets to the machine. They presumed that it was actually concerned about them and acting on their behalf. Despite its original intent to be able to understand human language and react to it, apparently it really did help some people work through some personal issues by interacting like a psychologist would. So much for serendipity. On the other hand, this idea where people convince themselves something is true, despite facts to the contrary, is usually attributable to folks that are socially prepared to be convinced of things. Indoctrinations such as father knows best, obey the law to be safe, and all humans are created equal are intrinsically flawed because everyone knows multiple examples of them not being true. Blake Lemoyne seems to be a person destined to find intelligence. He is an ordained mystic Christian priest who studied the occult and grew up on a farm in the southern United States among conservative Christians. He defends psychology as reputable science instead of merely the helping measure that it is. He was so convinced about his theory that he made overtures to Blaise Aguera e Arcus, Google's vice president, and Jen Janai, Google's head of responsible innovation, through an intermediary. They both looked over his assertions and said his conclusions were at odds with the facts. Being rejected like this, Lemoyne tried to get a lawyer to advocate for the computer program's rights and to address the U.S. House Judiciary Committee on its behalf. He said Google was being unethical. Lemoyne was placed on administrative leave for violating his confidentiality agreements by revealing internal documents. In a press release, Google stated, We have reviewed Blake's concerns per our AI principles and have informed him that the evidence does not support his claims. He was told that there was no evidence that Lambda was sentient. There was much more evidence that the program completely lacked intelligence. Humans seek to make sense of the world. It happens all the time with religious figures found on random pieces of toast, animal shapes in clouds, or star patterns in the night sky. Ordinary objects suddenly become human faces, ghosts, and angels in the background of pictures. Unsurprisingly then, our brains work similarly when interpreting words that we hear or read, automatically assuming there is intelligence behind their creation. It seems Blake Lemoyne is a victim of his conditioning and environment. Even though we know the Lambda system is far too small and unsophisticated to support a real mind of any description. Siri, Cortana, and Alexa are not intelligent, despite what their creators would like you to believe. In essence, they are modern-day Elizas, responding to key words and phrases through predictive algorithms. Try Eliza for yourself. The link is in the description. One of the largest supercomputers in the world recently used 37 million CPU cores on more than 95,000 separate computers in 9 petabytes of memory to emulate a human brain function. Not a whole brain's function, mind you, just one. Now, 9 petabytes is about half of what Google's search engine handles in just one day. For comparison, your own computer may have only one CPU with between 2 and 8 cores. 
all this computing power was churning out nearly 24 petabytes of data per second to sustain a simple function that was orders of magnitude less than what a human brain does. It consumed megawatts of electricity to produce only the tiniest fraction of what a human brain manages with just 12.6 watts on average. Right now, deep learning and neural networks are clumsy, power intensive, inefficient, and require vast resources to achieve very basic functions. Don't look for that to change anytime soon. Our algorithms are primitive and totally inadequate to support a true artificial intelligence. We may never achieve it in the lifetime of anyone currently living because it is an immensely difficult task. People that want to sell you new tech can call it AI all they want, but saying it doesn't make it so. We're decades away from real AI, and though deep learning and neural nets are really useful tools, they are not even remotely close to real AI. Though it may seem harsh, your AI companion on your phone doesn't care about you. It doesn't think. It doesn't love you. It is an excellent tool for helping you build social skills, for entertainment, and even for simulated romance, but it relies on the seldom used word verisimilitude, or the appearance of being true, rather than veracity, which is something that is actually true. The original Turing test does not reveal functional intelligence in a computer. At best, it could be said to reveal simulated intelligence. Instead, what the Turing test reveals is flaws in judgment by humans who come to conclusions using feelings intuition, and imperfect information. If we're thoughtful, diligent, and focus enough effort on the task, we might see real AI in a decade or two. But that still seems optimistic unless we have a stunning change in available technology. For now, the problem remains, defined by three parameters. We lack sufficiently powerful and fast technology. We lack capable algorithms for processing the necessary amount of information. And, as summed up by this meme, we have insufficient data.